It still looks like that I have two videos that have not been given access. So what's going to happen is these videos aren't going to play during your presentations. Um, all right. So briefly, the way this is going to go is that um, I will announce, uh, you know, who's the next, who's coming up to present, um, and. After that, uh, and then I will also announce who's the next team to present. So that'll be the team on deck. Um, and the way we're going to do this is uh, if you can, when you're announced to speak or uh, when you're announced as the team on deck, um, raise your hand with the Zoom app. That way I know who to unmute for uh, doing the speaking. Um, and we each um, team will get three minutes to present. Uh, we'll sh cut you off sharply, and I have the power to just mute you at that point. Um, and then after that, um, there'll be two minutes from Q&A from the judges, uh, kind of similar as well. We'll be very strict about keeping to that five minute, uh, to that two minutes as well, so that we have five minutes total for between the presentation and Q&A for each team. Um, and uh, let's see, okay. Let me just do one more check. So, as many of you, uh, again, congratulations on spending the last 48 hours uh, going through this uh, hackathon. Uh, in this virtual hackathon with us. It's one of the uh, first virtual hackathons that we've done, uh, and it's uh, one of, a, we hope, a series of these as well. Uh, so just to recap the process that you guys went through uh, over the last 48 hours, uh, you came together and pitched various problems underneath this track of uh, hospital assets, coordination, management, um, and then you self-formed teams around there on Friday night and Saturday morning spend the last 30 or so hours really um, building on those solutions, developing, uh, defining the problem, co-development of the solutions, um, and then uh, putting together your presentations. And you've had the uh, virtue of having uh, hundreds of mentors from uh, all of our partners and the healthcare innovation ecosystem globally uh, come and help you uh, iterate and ideate around these problems. Uh, and now we're at the stage that, where you'll be presenting your, uh, what you've accomplished over the last uh, 48 hours. Um, so we're going quickly back over the judging criteria. Uh, it's really under four categories that the judges will be evaluating on. One is the impact, which is, you know, have you how well you've defined this problem. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, is, it, is it really a meaningful and impactful problem to solve? Secondly, the innovation aspect, and this is more about the solution that you've developed, uh, giving us the rationale for why your particular solution will work. How is it different and unique compared to what's currently being used uh, and what is out there? Um, the second is to also focus on uh, taking into account all of those different stakeholder perspectives that are part of the problem and how you've addressed uh, all those challenges uh, and all those incentives of those stakeholders to align. The third part is the implementation. As you guys know by now, we're trying to develop solutions that can be rapidly uh, developed and then implemented by the end user, whether that's the health system, hospital system, whether it's the clinician, whether it's the nurse, whether it's the patient themselves. Um, you need to demonstrate to us that you've thought about that process what the things you need at that time point and how, to, um, and how what you're gonna be spending the near term and long term uh, to bring this idea and these solutions to fruition. And of course, lastly is the presentation and how well you've communicated all of these points to the judging panel, uh, as well as uh, the diff highlighting the diversity of backgrounds that are in your uh, various track, uh, in your various teams. Um, and really what's important here is that you needed to give us the credibility that, um, um, oops, one second, give us cred credibility on um, why you are the team to execute 
uh, on this particular uh, solution that you've developed. Um, so I'm gonna let the judges introduce themselves. Uh, and Chen, I apologize, we didn't get a chance to put you on this list, but uh, maybe Santosh, you can go first to introduce yourself. Thanks, Freddie. Hi all, my name is Santosh Mohan. I'm the managing director of the Brigham Digital Innovation Hub, also known as the iHub. Um, we drive digital innovation at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and are part of the Partners Healthcare or now called the Mass General Brigham uh, Network. Um, yeah, um, Freddie, do you want me to go into the details of what we do or is that good enough? That's good enough for now. I Thanks. And Chen, you want to go next? Yeah, I can go. So hi, everyone. My name is Chen Cao. Um, I'm the strategy manager at the Brigham Digital Innovation Hub. So working closely with Santosh and folks um, at the Brigham and across the Mass General Brigham uh, network. Okay. Uh, Nate? You're still on mute, Nate. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, guys. Um, hey, Nate Bear. I'm a managing director out of uh, Boston Consulting Group's digital ventures business in the Los Angeles area. Uh, I work completely in digital health. Uh, we're essentially like an innovation incubation shop within BCG, uh, working with all the Fortune 500 companies uh, that BCG works with. And happy to be here today. Looking forward to what everyone has to say. Thank you. And Lawrence? Hi, uh, Lawrence Stunts. I'm the director of the Massachusetts eHealth Institute, which is a state economic development agency here in Massachusetts. Uh, we're part of the Mass Tech Collaborative and focused on growing the digital health sector here in Massachusetts. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, so thanks for the, to the judges for spending their afternoon uh, listening to the pitches tonight, today. Uh, I think we have 23 presentations, so I hope everyone took their bio break and food break and whatever else they're needed because we're gonna sit tight for the next uh, two hours here. Um, and so again, really want to highlight and thank the um, all the different partners that have come together as part of this really amazing initiative. Um, really been happy to. Uh, Cole as the MIT community uh, behind this effort as well. This is a um, multi-group effort from different parts of MIT uh, to bring together the MIT COVID-19 challenge, um, but also really speaks uh, for itself in terms of the breadth of the and uh, depth of the ecosystem uh, from the healthcare innovation side. Um, everything from big pharma to big tech to our academic partners to our uh, clinical partners, um, these are all entities who are who are recruited and who are here to further help develop these your teams uh, after this weekend. Uh, so many of you have taken advantage of them throughout the weekend to get mentorship and to get expert advice as uh, they helped you ideate and iterate over uh, your thought process. Um, let's see. Looks like I'm just there's a few. Uh, questions here that I'm just going to address uh, quickly from the chat. Um, yes, you do not know the order of teams. Uh, you will know about five minutes before you present. Um, and at that point, you know, that's when you'll raise your hand so I can identify you to be able to uh, give you speaking privileges, so to speak. Um, after you present, you are welcome to, you are encouraged to stay in the channel and continue to listen to all the other presentations. Um, and where to raise your hand is a good one. It sh there should be an option somewhere around where you see all the lists of participants, I believe. Uh, but if somebody can help um, answer that question, that'd be great. Uh, in terms of slide flipping um, and who's going to control that I don't know if somebody can check, but do you have an option somewhere that, yeah, you should have an option that's ask for remote control. Um, and, that, and that way I can give you access to control the slides, so to speak. If that doesn't work because of technical issues, uh, 
we'll just need to have you uh, just say next slide and I'll advance the slides for you. Uh, any other questions? If so put them in the group chat here and I will address them now. Okay. If not, uh, let me just quickly see. I saw that uh, I'm gonna just refresh this and make sure that we get those videos in, see if there's any more issues. And it looks like I still have two media objects that Looks like this is from Team Ski Set. Okay, um, so is everyone ready? The first team is Team Hosp Hosby Helper. Um, and the team on deck is MedNet. Um, and can you? Let's see one second here. It's, okay, so can someone tell me in the chat who is Hospi Helper? Because I have too many raised hands here apparently. Okay. Um, if can if only the speaker of the team can raise their hands, that would be ideal. Um, okay, so let's see. Okay, and I just gave unmuted you. Are you able to request remote control? Or do you want me to advance the slide? If you can give it to Manuel, it would be great. Give it to who? Manuel? Well, you have, uh, let's see, Manuel. Okay. All right. Uh, whenever you guys are ready, I can start the timer. Like, does it work, the switching slick slide thing? I, it says Manuel is controlling my screen right now, so. Okay. And so then, let's it. start. We are team uh, Hospi Helper, and we're happy to present to you our solution. So let me start with a, with a short story. Uh, maybe next slide. Doesn't work. Um, I'll go ahead and... OK. About a friend of mine, um, his company usually produces uh, t-shirts. In face of corona crisis, he switched to producing uh, face masks. Um, he doesn't produce large quantities, but he's just one of many small scale producers on the market who want to help. The problem is that they don't know to which hospitals they should deliver to because they don't know which ones are in great need. Next slide. Um, on the other side. <laughs> okay. Takes some time. Okay. On the other side, hospitals struggle to plan for the future because they don't know how the situation will be evolving. Matching between hospitals and producers volunteering to provide medical resources is not supported. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. Um, to bring the ends together, our solution orchestrates and matches hospitals and producers based on resource demand and supply. On top, of that, we offer this, uh, the hospital a solution to predict the demands and resource based on the regional COVID cases. Next slide. The customer journey looks as follows. A company, for example, Ballard, switches their output uh, to medical vans, but they don't know where to deliver to. A hospital, for example, Dodge County Hospital, knows that they will be short on vans in five days by using our prediction. Our solution then matches them so Ballard can deliver their vans to the hospital and they're both happy. Next slide. Sorry. No worries. Also next slide, there should be a video. <laughs> Hopefully it works, perfect. Hospital employees open the registration form on their mobile to get valid access to the resource input page. They enter their local information. They also enter the need of each resource. 
they can then see the predicted spread in their area coming from the SEIR mathematical model. The providers get access to the map and can see in which areas certain resources are located and will be needed. Okay. Um, data is coming from various sources. For example, uh, sen census data from the US. Uh, we integrate them via, fl via Flask, backend in the MongoDB and AWS and user interface and front end is designed with Kepler GL. Okay, let's switch to the business side. Um, today, we've got a proof of concept that is validated with uh, many experts. For example, nurses, MDs, procurement experts, and business experts. Um, our funding will be around 150K needed for five developers, hosting, and marketing and sales. Piloting, uh, we are in contact with uh, potential hospitals currently in Germany and Switzerland, so we can roll out in the end of May. Um, the market situation is as follows. Customers um, would be, we, we would initial focus, can we switch the slide? <laughs> Initially, we would focus on like smaller rural uh, hospitals and then later on on big hospital chains. And uh, competitors are uh, government agencies and also large healthcare solution providers. Thank you very much. This is our team. Right. Thank you. So let's now turn it over to the judges for Q&A. Sure. If you could also unmute Manuel, he's also answering questions. Uh, so a uh, quick question for you guys. How will you validate that the manufacturers, you know, what if people are switching from t-shirts to masks. How will you validate yes. the, uh, that they meet all the specifications needed by a hospital? Um, actually, we're on, on, on this point, we are, we are happy that uh, the, the potential suppliers would give us valid information. Um, the validation is currently uh, in, in planning. And uh, for the first step, we are, we are hoping that everyone is willing to help and not kind of uh, giving false products or stuff like this. I hope this answers your question. That's helpful to know. Um, so just so I get this right, the, the hospitals are expected to use your platform, correct? Both are expected, yes, producers and hospitals. Hospitals will also get the prediction and uh, yeah, the producers yeah. Will, will get access to potential um, hospitals where they can deliver to. Yeah, and um, let me please add that on top of that, uh, producers can um, can always see where the resources will be needed, but uh, um, hospitals can um, request resources, but we have the simulation of the spread that's um, accessible for everyone, so also for the producers. Got it. So as part of the effort, um, to compile this, who have you consulted with? We have been consulting um, nurses. I think Eric is currently in the call. Um, we've also talked to, to another ICU nurse who's currently working in Boston and in, uh, in a COVID ICU who was very, we were very pleased to talk to him because he was just using his break to talk to us. And on the other hand, we were talking to uh, experts from the, um, from the healthcare business side who were giving us uh, useful information about database and also uh, how to, let's say, penet penetrate the market somehow. How do you see this working alongside existing hospital procurement systems with distributors? This is like the, the biggest issue that we also see. This is our competitor, but also potential partner. Since uh, a, cri a crisis is not only a business, uh, business opportunity, but also an opportunity to to like have some pro bono solutions. And uh, this is what we're hopefully counting on. Okay. Thank you judges for those questions. Uh, we're gonna go on to the next team now. Thank you. Thank you. So the team that's coming up is MedNet. Um, and the team on deck is uh, Node Nerds. Uh, okay. So Sarah, are you from MedNet? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Um, you can start whenever you're ready. And so does, do I have, con okay, I have control of the screen. I can, uh, hold on, let me just do that right now. 
Okay, you should be able to control now. Maybe. Um, no. Okay. I'll just have to oh. advance for you then. Okay. Um. So hi. Next. Um. We can start. Okay. Next slide. Um. Slide before. Sorry. <laughs> So we are a multidisciplinary team from Italy and we applied to this hackathon with the desire to contribute to help fight this problem that has shaken our beloved country to its very core. Next slide. Um, double another time. Next slide. The fact that we have three doctors on our team outlined the PPE shortage as a major problem in the COVID-19 pandemic. And so following our Italian experience where more and more doctors are being infected we decided that we wanted to try and protect our medical staff as much as we could. But how can you protect your medical staff if you lack the PPE? Next slide. We decided to create a risk stratification system that would put each single healthcare worker in one of three different risk classes and reassign the PPEs according to those categories. Next slide. Our risk stratification model takes into account three factors immunity based on serological antibody tests, exposure based on contact with definitely positive or possibly infected patients, and mortality based on age and comorbidities. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Relying on Amazon Web Services, we would offer the necessary cloud storage to the hospitals and the software that outputs the risk category of each healthcare worker based on a statistical model. The necessary input data is collected daily by a voice bot that, sorry, slide before, that interacts with each healthcare worker at the end of their shift. The output regarding the risk category is communicated via messages individually to each healthcare worker and to the hospital manager. This would allow a rational PPE and staff distribution based on our risk categories and significantly impact the safety of all medical workers in a context of PPE shortage. For example, a doctor which is proven to be immune would be placed in the lowest risk category and PPEs would be shifted to a higher risk medical worker. Next slide. We plan to implement the system within three weeks, but we are aiming for a better version by the end of the second week. We already have a simple statistical model based on the current availability of data, which will grow as the virus spreads. There is code source on the web available for a quiz game with Alexa, which we can adapt for our purposes. By the second week, the new data sets will allow us to update our model, and by the beginning of the third week, the first beta versions can be tested. Since we are an Italian team and many Italian hospitals are not informatized, this system would work regardless of that. This obviously applies also to third world countries with a very rudimentary healthcare system. Next slide. Next slide. These are the mentors that helped us. And uh, next slide, next slide, next slide. This is our team. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, for the Q and A's, um, would you uh, please add um, Raquel and uh, Angela and uh, Cristina? So if they can just raise their hands, that would be the easiest. Um, uh, I think yeah. they... They did, right? Yeah. Yeah. Freddie, should we jump in with questions? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so just I just want to repeat back, make sure I understand this properly. It's essentially an individual based risk model for within health systems where assume you'd assume that it would spit back maybe like a ranked order of risk against sort of yeah. named health workers. And exactly. then depending on resource availability, you can hand out PPE. Is that correct? Yes. I just want to make sure I understand it properly. Yeah. And what your and your hypothesis is that the risk models, the current risk models, are insufficient. So you need a more complex risk model, and it'll in order to do this on an individual basis. Um, for mostly also our risk model would be computed every single day because every day the doctor would interact with the voice bot, and so we would have a risk category which changes every you know every day. We know how to put this kind of this doctor in a. Um, different if it, if he changes classes based on change of the mention factors. Great. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, very helpful. You could imagine it actually going beyond the workforce too in the hospitals. Yes. As we think, you exactly. know, yes. the community level. Interesting. 
You went quickly through the business model. How, I mean, how would you plan to build this out and how would you plan to fund this? Um, I think Raquel can answer that. Can you, can you repeat the question, please? So from a business model, uh, there was a slide that said business model, but I don't think we ever addressed it. How would you build this out? How much would it take? And how would you fund it on an ongoing basis? How would we fund it? Yeah. Uh, so right now we'd be talking with the a principal software engineer of Anadin. So I guess we would walk that path. So keep on talking with him and try to see if we can uh, collaborate with other engineers of Amazon as well. Uh, there are two uh, engineers here in our group. So we will start with our skills, of course, but that the reason why we need partner agreements is because I think that this needs to be done fast. There's no need to do this in one month because the emergency in Italy is now. So I would guess that I put the major importance to the partner agreement really because uh, this is what we need. So we need uh, to have services that already work and implement our idea. All right, that's it for questions. And thank you uh, to Team Mennet and to the judges. Um, so next we have uh, Team Node Nerds and on deck is Team Van Dam. So we're gonna change the uh, kind of procedures a little bit. Only the team that's presenting right now should be raising their hands, uh, including anybody that is going to be answering questions as well so we and uh, unmute you all uh, sooner. Okay. And all right. Whenever. Should we just go through you, Freddie, to to do the um, transfer? So just just tell me your, um, next slide, and I'll move it forward. Okay, very good. My name's Sam Dewar. I'm part of the uh, the Node Nerds team, and we are looking at solving the COVID-19 crisis by implementing a nodal optimization model to effectively and efficiently distribute government and state supplies to the hospitals that are experiencing the largest surges. Next slide. We are a team made up mainly of industrial and mechanical engineers that are experienced in supply chain automation. Additionally, we have uh, experience in medical research, but our main focus is uh, automating supply chains and distribution networks. Next slide, please. The problem we're facing is that distribution of PPE is inefficient, and more specifically, the distribution of PPE from state and federal uh, resources is insufficient and um, the supplies are being sent to hospitals without the knowledge of what supplies and what shortages exist. And so that's leading to excess inventory within the hospitals that's creating regional shortages within major metropolitan and urban areas. Next slide, please. This is the current network that, that, and supply chain network that exists for the material being distributed by the state and by the government. What I'd like to focus on here is the inequitable uh, distribution from the state to the various hospitals. Without knowledge of the current hospital supplies, the states are just distributing uh, their supplies to the hospitals without an understanding of the current inventory that exists, leading to excess inventory at these hospitals that can be better distributed during times of surges. Next slide, please. We have a two-part solution to this problem. It's focused on communication coordination. The biggest piece is minimizing inventory that these hospitals obtain. By reducing the inventory at each hospital and instead transferring them to local nodes, regional distributors and warehouses, we're able to manage that excess inventory in a closer manner to all of the hospitals and deliver them in a just-in-time delivery method uh, uh, to the individual hospitals that are experiencing surges. Additionally, these regional distributors are able to um, move material between the between the different nodes so that if one city and one state is experiencing a surge, they can distribute from one node to another. If you go to the next slide, you'll be able to see the new model and, and what I just described. As you can see, the nodes are able to transfer their materials and their supplies in between to better match the surges that are faced from the hospitals beneath them. Also, the hospitals are now better matched with the respective inventory they need. Next slide, please. After running our model through uh, 10 days of simulation and five different hospitals, we were able to see 
an 89% reduction in excess hospital inventory accumulation from the FEMA and state shipments. Next slide. The three main variables that we took in, into consideration with our model are patient, patient surge projections, so the expected uh, surge that's coming, the current inventory, so what each hospital currently has on hand, as well as the stockpiles available at each node. Next slide, please. Okay, you're out of time now. Okay, the last implementation challenge and the largest one we're going to face is federal cooperation and for them to use the existing- We're out of time now. So okay. We're gonna yes. So, Questions for judges? Yeah, I was gonna say this is a very interesting. Um, one question is how quickly are you able to kind of set up these nodes uh, just because you know the, the timing is, 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 is critical? Sure, so that, that was addressed on this slide in the next one, but the um, quick availability of the shipping infrastructure we're going to rely on the government resources to contact these third-party distributors and um, uh, warehouses to basically use their existing infrastructure to just deliver the government and state supplies for them. And the funding that's already used to distribute uh, the government supplies to the hospitals and to the states will just be used to pay the third-party distributors. Got it. So you, you would have to work through um, the the states or the or FEMA essentially or the federal um, to get these set up. That's right. We decided to focus less on the uh, the current supply chain models that exist with hospitals procuring directly from the suppliers and focus on another part of the problem, which is delivering state and federal uh, procured resources. Yeah. It's a it's a fascinating approach, but you've nicely identified your own challenges for this plan and. You know, my my confidence is low in, in being able to accomplish this in like three or four weeks, but it's a significant problem and I'm glad someone's thinking about it. Okay, yeah, our, like I said, our plan with using existing infrastructure at the, the Amazons and major e-commerce and distribution networks through the world would enable them to use their already existing inventory models to to take in the government resources and distribute them to the hospitals that are experiencing the surges. That's at least our hope with the solution that we designed. Yep. Well, thank you, judges. And uh, so the next team is Ben Dab, and the uh, team on deck is Hupley. Team Van Dab here. Please raise your hand if you're part of that team. Okay. Um, if you're not here, then we're going to skip over your presentation. Uh, team Hupley is up next and then on deck is never latte again so can team happily raise their hands so we can unmute you all right sheila um yes but uh israel is presenting okay he needs to raise his hand. All right. Yeah, thank you. I was trying to activate my You ready? Microphone. Yeah, can I take control of the screen? Um, you can try, but it hasn't seemed to work uh, for whatever reason. Does it work? Yeah, nothing's happening. Okay, perfect. Hi, we are Supply, and we are bringing light to a turbulent market. I Need have Sam. For Sa you. Just tell me. Okay, Sam is a procurement officer for a chain of hospital. He he's been he's been desperately looking for all the medical supplies that he needs due to COVID nineteen pandemic. But there there's been a general shortage, so he ends up looking for medical supplies on eBay. Next, please. The lack of visibility of hospitals demand, suppliers capacities, and the location of goods leads to suboptimal allocation of assets. 
This is a big problem. Next, please. In fact, this problem represents that 69% of United States hospitals delayed care due to supply chain shortages, and the use of PPE increased four to 10 times due to COVID-19. Next. This is slowing the global economy growth by up to 7%, and it is expected that one in four small businesses are less than two months away from closing permanently. Next. This is where supply enters. We are going to enable an efficient supply chain by bringing visibility and transparency. Next one, please. This is Sam, and this is our platform, Hopply, where Sam can log in as a hospital. Next one, please. On this screen, on this screen, Sam is able to look for sanitizers, PPV, equipment, or other supplies. He's able to specify how much is he looking for, where does he need it, by when it must be delivered, and for how long will the position be open for the auction. Next one, please. Here, he will receive many offerings either by small manufacturers or small businesses that have converted their operations to, to meet this, this demand. Next, please. On the, on the left side of the screen, we can see the, uh, the request in, in matter. And on, next one, please. And on the right side, we can see the offerings received. Next one, please. Once he, sele once he selects an offering, he can set, uh, set up the delivery right through the platform and settle the payment with just one click. Next, please. On the supplier side, the suppliers see what open request might be a fit for them. Next, please. And they can make offers uh, for specifying all that the hospital is demanding. Next one, please. The suppliers will play by fair rules. There will be no price gouging on this platform. There will be better vendors, and we will put at the center the hospital's choices. Next, please. We're trusting efficient transportation for immediate shipments to ride-sharing application and traditional couriers for larger, large routine orders. Next, please. Our business model consists in a 5% transaction fee, and our value is giving visibility, connectivity, and convenience. Next one. The next steps are to launch the website MVP. Next, next, next. We're going to establish a vendor list, uh, the hospital sign up, next, and settle up some partnerships. We are asking for, next. We're asking, asking you to help, uh, asking you help for help to, by giving us introduction to hospital network, by and giving us an introduction to investor and access to supplier, suppliers. Next, please. We are a multidisciplinary and passionate teams that go from data science up to commercial design and intellectual property. Next, please. We are lending a hand by connecting hospitals to the people. Thank you. All right. Judges? Could you, could you explain how you see this as differentiated? I mean, you, you articulated that the eBay channel, the eBay marketplace is where people are going now. Why would they say, I'm going to go to apply instead of eBay? Well, first of all, there's a, a very high problem with trust. Uh, we've talked with a, procure, with a couple of procurement officers and people with experience on the supply chain of hospitals and say that, they, uh, that right now they cannot trust only on their wholesalers, which were, used to be their main suppliers. I know they have, have to go directly to big manufacturers that may be in Thailand, in Thailand or in India or in China. And that complicates a lot the, either the logistics team uh, and, the, and the trust between the parts. So. Uh, we believe in differentiating us by bringing maximum visibility, transparency, and trust. Um, also, just wanted to build upon that. This is Rohan speaking. Um, often, what the problem what the problem is with using traditional platforms such as eBay is that many of the buyer, many of the vendors will not accept large invoices and. Often many of these hospitals, they can't spend 50, they can't do a $50,000 order on a credit card. So with Apply, we're actually implementing the Shopify API and by integrating that, the, not only will hospitals be able to pay using invoices, um, but we will also require all the small businesses and small manufacturers to generate the invoice producing capability. Um, but they would be incentivized to do so because they're currently struggling for business and this would increase, they would give, give them a huge market. Also, there's a, a very important difference that in eBay, you look for the suppliers. This, uh, this is uh, raising the prices up and, uh, and, and raising the number of middlemen in, in, in the operation. This is the opposite way. Here, the hospitals bring visibility to their demands and the, and the small manufacturers, our businesses reach out to them. 
Yeah, Ashley. Thank you. Uh, so the next team that's up is Never Latte Again, and the team on deck is Optimal Allocation Group. Khalid, are you ready? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to say next, uh, and good. then we're good to go. Yeah. Cool. OK, next. On a normal day, nurses typically spend less than two hours of a 12-hour shift on direct patient care. As you can imagine, this gets worse during high demand times like today. More than 60% of a nurse's time is spent doing paperwork, searching for medications and supplies, coordinating activities, and managing inventory, with inventory and supply management being their biggest challenge. To help them out, we thought of tackling two key issues, the manual time-consuming process for inventory management and the lack of real-time visibility on supply to enable dynamic coordination and replenishment. Next. To solve this, we combined hardware and software solutions to create an integrated ecosystem linking supply and auto refilling. We've got a camera with object recognition capabilities. We've pre-built dashboard overlays to give you real-time data insights on inventory and prompt automated ordering based on consumption and supply levels. Through this, we can have a imp direct impact on nurses, the supply chain, the clerks, and finance. Next, we've effect we're effectively going from a manually multi-touch process to a seamless and low-touch one. Immediately, you can see there is a 40% reduction in number of touches, lowering the risk of exposure of infection. 50% reduction in number of process steps, giving nurses and doctors the capability to spend time where they're needed the most, with patients. Next, and then you can hit play on the demo. Uh, what you can see coming to life in the demo is deep learning capabilities using TensorFlow, OpenCV, and MatPilot. Continuously improving the ability through Google Images, Search API, and Bing Images API, and NVIDIA, and a bunch of other super hardcore stuff that I can't really tell you what it's about because I'm not technical. <laughs> We've built this on a Google Nest, but the code is ubiquitous and can be loaded to most hardware. Next. We've also built product dashboards. Here you can see some sample dashboards focused on giving nurses the right information at the right time and taking the stress off by showcasing ETAs of deliveries. Next, we've compared our solutions against what we've seen in the market, RFID, vending machines and whatnot. And we know we have a differentiated model because we can easily integrate what we've built on pre-existing hospital infrastructure. Next, this is kind of uh, orange is how we overlay what we've got on top of existing infrastructure. Next. So through Insight, we're making a difference by directly improving patient care and safety and taking the burden of inventory management off the nurses' minds. And then next, this is in terms of implementation, we're obviously gonna fine tune the solution. We're gonna run small scale pilots within the hospital to build trust and then scale it across the hospital first. And then ultimately, if we can get our entire hospital on it, we'll do the same in next hospitals and continue scaling it until we can get regional based models. Next. Super stacked team. We've got folks from design, development, healthcare, operational expertise, and just a couple of dudes have got serious horsepower. <laughs> Done. Thank you, Colleen. Judges? Do you want to back it up to the How It Works page just so you can flash? Is that possible to flash it up? Or you went really quickly through that one. The one before. Yeah, that one. This one? Thank you. So just to clarify, this is effectively like an optical reader. So like there's, you know, OCR readers and inventory uh, uh, management, which if it, which read characters, you're talking about basically doing with objects instead of characters in order to sort of, you know, accelerate the inventory management process. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So it's a camera there in the in the supply room, and essentially, as they're pulling out things, it uh, recognizes it, feeds it into the database, and deducts uh, the number out of it, and then loads up on the dashboard that we've created too. So you can see it right off the bat, and it would trigger some automation prompts to supply chain based on like the demand and consumption. This is more of a feedback comment. I think you guys, this is actually a major issue in hospitals across the board that goes well beyond PPE. Totally. This and hospitals wrestle with using RFID versus OCR and um, 
you could leverage, if you could get this platform working for just a handful of SKUs within PPE, that could yeah. be an easy way to get traction towards sort of longer term applicability across hospitals. Yeah, totally. And, and that's kind of our, what was our idea was to start here and then grow the SKUs over time because we know this is something that hospitals are challenged with even, even during normal days, right? So being able to scale it and, and develop kind of these smart uh, supply rooms. Yeah, based on your um, you know, preliminary research, how are you planning to price these, um, like the whole, the whole product essentially? ecosystem as a service. So we're gonna price it by the supply room because uh, you essentially get a camera and a dashboard and essentially just monthly billings. I really like it. I think you've introduced a nice, uh, nice layer to sort of remove a few different touch points along the way. Um, there's a lot of detail packed in this deck and we have to peel it layer by layer to understand it a little bit more, but uh, totally. great idea. Yeah, well, you guys have it. Uh, you know, you got, you got our names. <laughs> Thank you, Khalil. Thank you, Khalil. Thanks, judges. Uh, the next team we have on is Optimal Allocation Group. And on deck, we have Medlink. Sorry, just to make sorry, clear, the last one was called Insight, where we're tracking in the, in the... Yes, I just want to make sure I'm capturing the name right, the feedback. Hello. All right, Madhav, okay, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, we are team Optimal Allocation, and our pitch is about Med Allocate. Next. So with the current state of crisis, the main issue that's there is the dearth and misappropriation of resources that hospitals require to treat patients and difficult decisions that hospitals need to take as to which patients can get specific equipment or not. So clearly there's some imbalance in the system right now and what we are trying to mitigate is that imbalance. Next. So amongst all the problems that hospitals face, um, some of them are demands, cost, timings, another one, is price gouging at the hands of manufacturers and distributors, such as 3M, which are facing right now. So the standard solution is the use of group purchasing organizations, but in a crisis time, it's too slow to implement um, the spread of resources through them. So what we are trying to do is establish a channel of communication between hospitals and suppliers, which is efficient and time saving. Next. So the solution we have is a web-based application that connects medical suppliers to hospitals. Next. So essentially there are two interfaces to our tool. The first is we use inventory data that hospitals have and patient database entries to give an approximation of their allocation needs and give that on mass for a state or a locale to suppliers and suppliers see the total demand, fix their prices there and send their um, resources to be allocated. Next. So the whole process at a glance is initially we do um, prediction modeling. Um, next. We do prediction modeling using deep learning techniques and to predict the density of cases. Then we combine that with the hospital stock levels. And eventually we have an allocation scheme that we can have for all of the hospitals in a given locality. Next. So our essential, the basic model, the neural nets that we'll be using in our model is using the spatiotemporal data that we have of a given place. And um, we feed it into a self-organizing map. And this gives an optimal allocation for any given point in time. Also a prediction over a certain time point. Next. So what is the difference of this from the existing solutions, which is GPOs? Um, our method does not allow for price gouging because suppliers have to see a total demand and fix their prices with respect to that because of which there's, uh, it mitigates the possibility of price gouging. Um, since our app is a neural network, it'll update constantly with new data and it'll give a forecasting with respect to what supplies a hospital needs. And it allows for timely action, which you cannot get from a GPO. Um, it also, um, next, yeah. uh, it also allows for the, uh, meeting of future demands, as I'd mentioned, and there are many opportunities for integrating crowdsourced data in this, which hospitals require, like for example, immune Oh, next. 
So um, what are the further steps that we'll need to take in this? So we need to have a data collection scheme, which uh, would require collaborations of hospitals. Uh, we need to develop a neural uh, a network, which we've been working on over the weekend. Uh, we would have to create a web-based platform such that the hospitals would have a channel with the suppliers. And um, we would do preliminary testing and an outreach program. So essentially, we've created a channel between hospitals and suppliers without direct communication between the two. So um, this is our team. Uh, we have... Um, people who have a lot of depth in neural networks and we've been consulting mentors with respect to the business side of things as well. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? So two big questions for Brian. What are the, what's the business model? And then can you dig into how you think you're going to get the data? Cause that seems like a really big challenge to get enough data to inform your analytic models, particularly um, on the hospital side. So uh, with respect to the business model, um, We've been talking with uh, mentors about how you would be able to pitch this uh, respectively. So um, given that hospitals have an agreement to form GPOs for that, you would be likely to pitch it directly to hospitals and suppliers. And um, as of now, for the pricing, we haven't uh, been able to think along those lines, but we are consulting with people on the business side of things. Um, also, with respect to data, um, there's data from the coalition um, document given by the CDC, which gives details on the localities and the um, cases in a specific place. Um, also, additional data would be at the hest of the cooperation of hospitals in this case. But we can always train preliminary model and see if we are able to get a good predictive score. What's your estimated timeline? Um, so as of now, we've uh, we've been uh, we have. Uh, LSTMs in the pipelines. So in order to get the data and approach people, so um, most of us, have, uh, our whole team is based in India. So as of now, all the data that, that we can get, we can get from local hospitals in our area. So uh, I, I would say over three months, we would be able to get enough for a preliminary testing model. Thank you, judges. Thank you. Uh... Next team is Medlink, and on deck is Team Skesset. Freddie, quick question. What was the name of the previous team? Sorry, I missed it. Uh, oops. Back Med optimal Al Allocation Group. Optimal yeah, ultimate, Optimal Allocation Group. Thank you. 45. Yep. <coughs> Let's just give the judges a couple minutes to get. Uh, yeah, you're all good. Okay. All good? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. My, is my voice coming through? Yes. I think, I think we're good. Yep. All right. All right. So, can you hear me? All right. So, we are Medlink. Um, we're a team of undergrad students at Georgia Tech, but we're really all across the country. Um, we are in different forms of engineering and computer science. So um, basically, you can go to the next slide here. Um, so from our talks with experts, um, we've seen that hospitals have never really had to track PPE inventory in the past in as such detail as they have now. Um, and this is leading to an info shortage and uh, supply mismanagement of this critical resource. So um, currently, we're looking at there's some ineffective solutions, such as a CDC PPE burn rate tool, which you can see there is the Excel sheet. Um, but that's cumbersome and it's not really anything else besides a manual log and hospitals otherwise have to re rely on you know the federal government or uh, suppliers but the question is with the amount of ppe that we have now how do we optimize the distribution of it and make sure that's being used in the best way possible next slide so that's where we come in using united state national state and county level coronavirus data which is updated daily we project the expected increase in PPE usage due to increased hospital admissions for coronavirus cases. For each hospital, we use this projection combined with its size and unique proximity to demographic centers to generate a prediction for the lifespan of current PPE stock. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about the model first. Um, so this is our final product and we actually have a working model. So this prediction right here is an actual prediction for mass gen. Um, as you can see, we assume they start with 14,000 gloves and within 
four to six days, the number of gloves reaches minimal and even critical levels. So this model can be used right now. We're pull, we have all the data sources and our edge is we have county level data sources. So you can actually run this on any hospital in Suffolk County. On the left, this video playing here shows you how we bring this model to the user. So we made a web app and the web app allows hospitals to put in their information and then on the screen receive the real time result um, in both visual and the, the data. Here is a, after learning the result, they can go to a platform to post um, requests for equipment. Next slide, please. So the impact that MedLink will have on the current PPE shortage can't be understated. Uh, we're connecting high priority hospitals with suppliers and we're pro providing hospitals with a projection for their PPE depletion, which will reduce stock anxiety and help distribute PPE across the country. Our web app also allows hospitals to request emergency PPE to further emphasize their priority to suppliers. Next slide. So to transition this from a hackathon to a real world solution that can actually help people today, we've already proved that our solution is very, very accurate because we're able to pull, we're constantly pulling live coronavirus data from our from models online daily and re rebuilding our model every single day to make it more and more accurate as time goes on. But most importantly, this model works today completely and it works for any count, any hospital in Suffolk County. And it's very, very easy to expand and scale out because all, we have all the data available on several uh, databases online. All we need to do is just download it and run it through our model that's constantly improving day by day too. And at the end of the day, it has a great product market fit because it's very easy for users to be able to access. It, the inputs are super user-friendly and easy information that administration has access to. And lastly, it actually solves a problem they really, really need by reaching out to suppliers. Out of time. Yeah. Judges? So I didn't see in here how you connect to suppliers. It's all so, yeah. about modeling how the PPE will be used, but uh, how would you connect to suppliers? So the thing is like, they kind of skipped through the video earlier. It was supposed to play a little bit later as we were talking about it. But what we essentially do is uh, once we built throughout the web app, once they're able to have put out the request for what they're looking, suppliers, we would look to partner with organizations like FEMA to essentially have them redirect their sources based on people that put out their needs. So if certain hospitals throughout the country say they have this need for this type of PPE, and this is their shortage when they're going to run out, then suppliers will be able to see who's in most dire need and be able to reach out. So the connection for suppliers would be to go through our website, and we would do that by partnering with organizations like FEMA. Great. I mean, there's, there's a couple of components of this platform that I really like. I think the, the hospital dashboard and being able to predict when we're going to uh, run out of, uh, or model when we're going to run out of things, or reach critically low supply levels. I think that's very interesting to me. Um, you know, would love to learn a little bit more offline. Absolutely, definitely. Yeah, we have to yeah to connect with us. Do you do you know if hospitals? I mean, <clears throat> days on hand of inventory is a pretty standard metric that any inventory manager would use. Yeah, Are they so, doing this for PPE now? Because you're effectively talking about a more predictive version yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. So the, that's the thing, right? Because we found that um, surprisingly, oh, I guess maybe not surprisingly, since in the past, right, hospitals, I mean, you use PPE whenever you need it, right? Um, and so they don't really keep a very strict tracking of their PPE. So like some nurses say like, okay, well, I'll manually scan in these different boxes and like write the paperwork out and keep track of it manually. But that just, you know, it's it's something that takes a lot, a, lot, a lot of time. And it's also something that like some hospitals just don't keep track of. I think they're operating more on the basis of I either have the PPE available or I don't, you know, it's like, it's like a very black and white thing. So that's where we're trying to help out with prediction. And just to quickly add on to that, um, PPE use does really depend on, especially now a lot of external factors. So we love that our goal is to try and bring in this really local data um, and combine it with the predictions. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have team, team set and on deck is team Anon Chain. Shoban, are you ready? Shoban, we can't hear you.
Sorry, nobody is sharing screens here. Please stop this. Okay. All right, we're have, gonna have to skip you because you're not following the directions here. Hello. 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 Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so, can you connect my team member, please? Sachin Aditya. You're going to have to tell me to advance slides to move this forward, okay? Nobody else is sharing their screens. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you please uh, uh, can you please add my team member? They need to raise their hands for us to be able to unmute them. Uh, Hello, sir. Sir, can you hear me, sir? You ready to come? Yeah, he has been uh, raising the hand. Yeah, he has been uh, raising the hand, sir. Hello, hello. Hello. Please hello. go ahead and start. Please start. Uh, can you connect my uh, uh, team member, sir, Sachin Aditya? He's gone to uh, present the team. Your team member needs to raise their hand so we know how to present them. Sachin Aditya. Right now, you're the only person with their hands raised. The rest of your team is not. No, we are he has been raising the hand, sir. Go ahead and start. I mean, I am starting the timer right now. So if you're not going to start, you're going to lose time. Yes, he texted you. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes, he texted you. Okay. Hello. Sir. Sir. Go ahead. Can you hear me, sir? Sir, he has been uh, texted you, sir, in the chat. We are moving on to the next team. Hello, hello. All right, Anon Chain, are you up? Can yeah, that, but I'm not sure if it's going to work. Okay. Yeah. We so remote before and it hasn't worked. So. Sure. Sure. Thank you. One second. Whenever you're ready. Yeah, yeah it's not working. Uh, uh, just have to tell me next. 
So we are team Anon Chain. Uh, we are automating connectivity and uh, availing usability in this uh, crisis situation and also upon the crisis situation. Next. In this situation, we have already been observing that almost 15% uh, of medical personnel are engaging with inventory activities. Volunteers are not able to manage inventory activities and hospitals are not connected all across the supply chain suppliers. And also now as many vendors are coming on board, they are not able to chat with them. And new, com new, new uh, companies are, uh, cannot adhere to regulation when they don't have a certain learning software, learning medium for that. Next. So now, right now, there are alternatives already in place that are uh, very outdated, uh, database systems. Now we want a robust connected data system which can keep informed total supply chain during the crisis and upon the crisis. Next. Our solution is very simple and we scale down it to the bare metal. Now we are providing onboarding support with uh, video chat tools and also regulation compliance checking. We are providing tools with asset tracking, uh, asset tracking to, to the database and then connected to the redundant database also so that they can, there can be consistent tracking. Then we are providing predictive analytics with the already accumulated data. And also we are providing uh, an API service to hook, the, uh, to hook all the existing data services. Next. This is our prototype which we have been working. Uh, so this is the onboarding screen where you have, uh, you onboard and then come onto the platform. And then you have, this is the hospital's dashboard where we provide the details on predictive analytics. And this is our website. Please go there to view the model. Next. So this is our business model. During crisis, we are expecting federal grant and hospitals to support this now expenses only business model so that we can go through this. Uh, crisis. Upon surfing from the crisis, we will extract a certain fee from hospitals and the vendors to maintain our service, a warehousing services, and uh, they will completely give the equipment cost. Right now, we are asking them to scale down the cost. Next. This is our timeline. Uh, we are up to alpha release by within uh, two weeks. Uh, and we already are working on these three uh, important parameters. We have already started work on prediction model. We have our web app uh, de developed and uh, mostly our services will be on operations. So we, we are trying to uh, uh, gain stakeholders. Next. So this is our beta release. Once we accumulate the data, we will work on additional predictive analytics so that we can uh, help these stakeholders in better ways possible and rank them possibly. Next. Upon these beta releases, we will be working on testing and uh, inventory model validation and then finally release our crisis version. Next. This is our team. We have been multi uh, multilingual diverse team and we have certain uh, covered aspects of this uh, model and we'll be recruiting new uh, developers once we progress to towards development. Thank you. All right, judges. It wasn't clear to me how this is significantly different than a, a than existing inventory management systems. So existing inventory management system is not allowing third party app uh, third party uh, sources to hook onto the existing service. In sense, these are not allowing any permissions to allow to other uh, sources to upload the data. So our service will be overlaying over the existing service, then allow these permissions to come in and then uh, update this data in the hospital supply chain. And right now, as there is no interconnection between these group of hospitals, uh, certain uh, a lot of group of hospitals, we are connecting this uh, common channel between hospitals and old vendors and new vendors. So there is a complete chain between them because in, in uh, past, the chain was to uh, only from the hospital to specific contractor. So they fix the deal and they just put the permissions in place in these two nodes only. So now we are trying to distribute these nodes during this crisis. But after the crisis, it depends on hospitals whether they want to retain that permission or then they, they want to just uh, stick with their own uh, supply chain. And how, how would you verify if, if a particular 
vendor is, you know, has experience or have processed anything in the past? So uh, while that- launching, we are trying to contact few regulatory bodies uh, so that what we're trying to do is come up, come out with PPE regulations which um, right now in developing countries, those are provided to suppliers based on the certifications. So already if they have a certification for different production line, we are trying to contact uh, federal authorities to scale down those regulations to medical regulations, how to compare those regulations with medical regulations. And then while they are onboarding, we will check all the documents OCR doc- uh, through OCR, verify them. And then if pos- if required, we'll do manual intervention during that regulation also. That's the reason we have scaled down our timeline. Can you speak to to the first question of how this differentiates from existing inventory management solutions? Like, let's say it works in all the way you imagine. Oh, sorry, Freddie. So, we're out of time. We're out of time. Next. Okay. Thank you. So the next thing we have is supply ASAP and on deck is Corona Connect. And we're not gonna be able to do remote control. It hasn't worked before, so please don't try to request anymore. Just tell me next when you're ready to move on, okay? Okay. Go ahead and start when you're ready. Hello. Sir, we are from Team H044. Uh, present- hello. So, um, hello, we are Team Supply ASAP and meet Judy. Next slide. Uh, she has been very stressed recently because of the shortage she has during COVID-19. She doesn't know how she can mobilize the supplies during this critical time. Next slide, please. As you can see, this slide is a comparison between two states, the number of masks they requested against and the number of COVID cases they have. Florida requested much more masks in terms of ratio compared with New York. But as we all know, New York is in a much more critical position than Florida. Next slide, please. Allow us to introduce supply ASAP. Our vision is to reimagine the medical supply chain by creating a new exchange. Next slide. Via P2P marketplace, supply ASAP facilitates the transfer of resources of those with access to those in need. Uh, play the video, please. Uh, here is how our product works. Once Judy logs in, she is able to view her dashboard, which gives her an overview of the supply management of different departments and critical resource demand search. Based on the hospital inventory and supply schedule, Supply ASAP will not only predict using AI, but also recommend using process mining to Judy. When to purchase, what resources, and from whom, either a supplier or a neighboring hospital. Next slide. In order to build and scale fast, we decided that we would use mature, fast, and reliable technology to assemble the platform. The platform requests information from the hospital database using API integration and receive CSV files which are processed in AWS forecast to predict the demand of resources. At the same time, Silonus is used for process mining to optimize resource management, distribution, and transaction. Next slide. Our product has an upper hand when compared to our other flourished companies, as we can predict the exchange ecosystem enabled by AI for inventory forecasting and also API integration with existing inventory management tools. Next slide. Our promise is to ensure that safety of the 800K plus frontline practitioners attempt to unlock and redeploy up to 50% of the excess stock and reduce delivery time by up to 75%. Next slide. In the near term, we aim to monetize two revenue streams, transaction fee and offering invoice financing. Uh, We also plan to expand from P2B to B2B. Next slide. Our go-to market strategy is to offer our product at a 66% discount for the first 12 months in order to help the most impacted hospitals. We believe we have a strong business economics and even with such a steep discount, we can recover our investment in two years. Next slide. We have an eight-week plan in place. We are two weeks away. We are four, four weeks away from launch and eight weeks away from scaling the solution. Next slide. We are a multidiscipline team with experience in entrepreneurship, data science, business development, technology, and design. We are bonded by the mission to solve the inherent issues in healthcare industry, and we are dedicated to launch the solution. Thank you. Judges. So in order for this to work, you have to replace the existing procurement systems in hospitals. Is that correct? Yeah. 
Hi, this is Sandra. I, I don't believe that we are um, replacing any existing system. We're talking about overlaying the system with another layer of API so that we can actually extract information from that existing system. There's no replacement here. And, and the feed is really a CSV file. Is that how you're thinking about it? Yeah. Yes. Any other questions from the judges? Okay. Well, thank you. Let's go on to the next. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next team is Corona Connect. And on deck, we have Supply Blockchain. Right, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, can you cool. hear me? Cool. Um, okay, we're ready. Hello, everyone. I'm Pratik, and this is a Hospital Inventory Management System, or HIM, by Corona Connect. Next slide, please. Every day, millions of patients are carrying infectious diseases, and the narrative is the same across the board. Healthcare workers are worried about their safety. With the frontline needing millions of masks, gloves, gowns, and goggles, suppliers simply cannot meet the demand. In the wake of growing shortages, many well-wishers are donating PPE, but we find that they often do not make it to the front lines. Why is that? Next slide, please. So we spoke to Mr. Mohan, Ms. Dunn, and Mr. Tsao, who are all leaders at the Mass General Brigham, as well as Ms. Taylor from UHS, and we found that while the healthcare system is very well equipped to handle a consistent supply chain of vendor purchases, the gap exists in donations, and we see the hospitals get overwhelmed. Next slide, please. So that is the gap. Next slide. So the experts tell us of four problems. Disorganized donation systems, incorrect reporting, fragmented records, and inefficient inventory methods, which lead to poor allocation and tracking of PPE and um, lost lives. Next slide, please. All right, so how do we bridge this gap? When devising a solution, there are three consistent ideas that we follow through with in the design process. We, number one, we decided to build an easy user interface uh, for an already overworked hospital staff that integrates well with their everyday workflow. Number two, we wanted to use software features to fit the distribution needs of hospital material management teams, whether it was floor-to-floor -floor inventory or uh, building, building in fit testing functionality for N95 masks. And number three, we wanted to consolidate a fragmented donation system like what Pratik mentioned into a single easy to use location. We built all of this into a central web application platform that we like to call HIM. Next slide. For HIM, we built out UI and backend for PPE tracking forms, an intelligent data dashboard, and donation management. HIM allows hospitals to efficiently track and predict a highly volatile PPE inventory's usage, shortages, and surpluses for a hospital. Next slide. One of the coolest features, in my opinion, is a set of backend scripts that we wrote to automatically parse, classify, manage, and respond to donation request emails from the community to simplify the lives of hospital managers. Next slide. We saw a model of inventory management with our mentor, Jennifer Taylor's consulting company, UHS, but their system was not well equipped to handle large fluctuations of inventory from small donations and vendors on a regular basis. So we designed a solution for that gap and reached out to our mentors in the MassGen Brigham network who were willing to pursue the possibility of working together to implement HIM. Eventually, we plan on expanding our application to the mobile platform, which will be more user-friendly for materials managers on a regular basis. Once it has been thoroughly done to optimize mobile and web-based HIM, it will scale up to be tested in more hospitals to improve their inventory organization in this chaotic time. In order to meet this timeline, however, our team would require more mobile app developers and additional staff to facilitate communication between more hospitals. Next slide, please. Our team is one of engineers and scientists working with healthcare business industry professionals. and We are ready to tackle this challenge with HIM. Thank you. Thank you, judges. So you cited one of the problems up front of kind of getting all the data, given all these disparate sources. Can you just articulate how you're overcoming that here? Uh, yeah, like totally. What's, what's, what's the like, what's the real differentiating factor that lets you pull it all together effectively? Yeah, for sure. 
Um, so let's say there's a bunch of different hospital managers in a certain hospital like MassGen, and they're all getting emails um, from different sources. All they need to do in our case is they forward all of their emails saying like, hey, can we donate this? Hey, can we donate that? They forward those emails to a central email. And then that our backend script that we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, will basically parse all those and stick them into a really simple centralized uh, database where they can go through and check off and auto respond and all that, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense, thank you. Um, I love the donation management features of this um, and I like your uh, script. I mean, we'll have to test it out with a few sample emails to see how much of a magic it can spin, but really like the donation management. It's a, it's a significant challenge. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. One other qu the question is, what, what do you see kind of once this, um, you know, situation dies down, what do you see kind of this tool becoming um, after, after this pandemic? Question. Uh, great question. This is a tool built for a time where the supply chain is very volatile. Um, so you're getting like really high quantities, a really high volume of donations that are all really small quantities. So anytime that like any organization needs to handle donations at a large scale, they could you know use the software and change it as needed. Um, that's our current plan. It's mainly used for like very volatile times in supply chain, if that makes sense. All right, thank you. The next team is supply blockchain, and on deck is COVID. Oh. Sorry to be asking, what was the name of the previous team? Guys, can one of you tell me? It was uh, COVID or Corona Connect, right? Corona Connect, Connect. yes. Thank you. Supply blockchain. Okay. Are you guys ready? Yep. Yeah, we're ready. So we are the COVID-19 Supply Blockchain Initiative, which is changing the sub current supply chain into a blockchain format. Next slide, please. Currently, the problem is the hospitals and healthcare system demands are not communicated effectively um, with manufacturers and the supplies are not shipped um, effectively to hospitals. And so this leads to a lack of PPE and drugs, which will risk provider lives and prevents life-saving treatments. In some countries, only 10% of the ventilator orders were able to be filled. Next slide, please. Um, top right, you can see the current supply, uh, supply chain system is long, complicated, and in inflexible. We have done internal research and found that uh, supplies exist, but unable to contact because it is heavily controlled by third-party distributors, resulting in a lack of communications between supply and demands. That's why when crisis or any distribution happens, the whole system fails to maintain and manage inventory and the quality of products. Our blockchain so solution can help in four areas. A transparent, decentralized purchasing platform enable peer-to-peer -peer communication in real time. More flexible system connecting the supply and demand directly. Its traceability enhanced product safety and inventory allocation. And smart contract increased the system efficiency. Next slide, please. When we were examining the stakeholders in this space, we identified five key players and really focused on our physicians as being the end user of this blockchain platform. And based on numbers from last year, uh, we see a total addressable market of 227 billion. Next slide, please. We're using blockchain as a service uh, subscription uh, uh, business model. On the right, it is our first version of the platform that's facilitating uh, buying and selling medical supplies. All stakeholders have access to real-time information. Transaction status will be updated everywhere within minutes with full tra traceability from point of origin to its end user. Next slide, please. The main advantage is the transparency and traceability, especially useful for donation distribution and allocation. Also, since we don't have a lot of data available around coronavirus, this allows us to collect quality data for better planning and forecasting in the future. 
And on the flip side, the main challenges that we envision is really the cost and time to implement. Our current IT and EHR systems are really fragmented and to transform them, it costs up to $2 billion, depending on the size of the system. And currently healthcare and blockchain is kind of um, disparate in terms of how it can be applicable. So really um, involving a key player to scale this platform will be difficult. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And based on the critical nature of COVID-19, uh, we see that implementation is urgent. So we are looking at utilizing a white label solution initially while developing our own proprietary system uh, ongoing. And just to end this um, presentation with a quote, uh, the business world needs to take up responsibility since gov governments haven't been able to. That was from Jamie Dimon. Thank you. Judges? So how are you going to sign people up for this? There's a lot of parties involved, and these things only work when they're all on board. Um, since the urgent of this situation, I think a lot. Um, we 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 did a lot of research. There's our um um supplies are available to distribute, and there's hospital they're in need for supplies. And the, um, signing up is not really um it's it's very fair, fairly easy at this point. And just to add to that, uh, it is critical for suppliers to come on board and we are looking at utilizing our own corporate networks uh, overseas and locally to uh, help us adopt suppliers and hospitals uh, within the system. What level of security do you anticipate needing in this system? Because one of the challenges if you've got multiple uh, distributors on a network like this is, you know, ensuring that people have access to the right level of uh, information about all the different supplies. Uh, we are going to use um, a blockchain as a database for all the um, certificate and all their, um, all their information. So um, we will give right permission to the right people. And I think just to elaborate on that, when we were connecting with um, a mentor that we were speaking to yesterday, um, she also did mention that blockchain essentially can be operated like specifically within certain enterprises. So it allows those key players to have proprietary access to that data. Um, so I think that's the model that we're looking after in terms of you know, ensuring that data, data is protected and is private as well. And how do you see this as differentiated versus the other sort of supply chain control tower type solutions we've seen today? Like why does the blockchain offer differential value in transacting PPE? Well, first of all, it is um, uh, in real time. Everything's updated uh, um, and, and uh, also open communication. Also, it's a traceability can, re um, can, um, can provide um, uh, product quality, quality control, especially, for example, if, um, if you are in need of a black bags, you really need um, to to see all, um, the whole process, you need the quality control and uh, where blockchain can really um, offer value right there. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next we have team COVID, on deck we have AHS. Bob, you... Yep, go ahead. Okay, so we're a team COVID, the clip on ventilator. Uh, as we know, uh, let's see, first slide for, okay. As you know, no, first slide. Okay, there's a massive crisis, global crisis going on now, and one of the critical shortages involves ventilators. Next slide. There's a massive mismatch between the number of patients requiring breathing support or mechanical ventilators and the existing supply of ventilators or um, that which can be produced. Next slide. So our solution, which is a very novel design and brand new type of ventilator, which we're hoping will substitute 
for the current traditional uh, ventilators basically repurposes uh, very common equipment and supplies in the hospitals. It's rapid and scalable. Uh, it, we can be in production in several weeks and um, it will supplement uh, current oxygen delivering um, capabilities. Next slide. So here we see an animation of the core concept of this novel design. And this is the toroidal balloon. This is a balloon that will be placed around the AMBU bag and it will be intermittently insufflated from an air compressor, uh, an elastic material which will rebound and it will basically compress, release, compress, release. Next slide. So here we see the design of our device. Basically, the air compressor is the largest component and then we have air hoses running from a pressure regulator and the big advantage of this device is you can hook up multiple patients to the single compressor. Each hose coming off the central hose will have its own pressure and flow regulator, so you can do multiple patients at once. Uh, this is uh, very lightweight and portable. The, um, the air compressor itself maybe weighs 40 to 50 pounds. These other things are soft plastic, um, and we're we did a cost analysis. We believe this can be produced between $500 to $700, depending on the rating of the compressor, compared to the current refurbished value of a $17,000 ventilator. Next slide. So um, this is our implementation and stakeholders. We received very uh, generous consultation from um, Kevin Elias and Dan Grunder. Uh, we, uh, uh, Dr. Elias has very graciously offered the use of his mannequin for testing of our prototype. Uh, we are sourcing materials as I speak. We hope to have it all sourced by April 10th, and we plan to have a prototype built by April 15th um, that we will be able to test on the mannequin, do some fine tuning, troubleshoot, and have the final design by April 22nd. Next slide. Thank you, you're out of time now. Okay. Judges? Um, it's, it's a very interesting uh, concept. One thing is just like in terms of validation, I know you have, you are planning to, you know, do this on mannequins and stuff, but, um, you know, has a similar uh, method been, you know, implemented or just kind of designed um, elsewhere, um, just in terms of like basically getting the evidence that this is going to Right. So one of the things we analyze and compare, made comparisons with is MIT has an event team and they have online their designs and schematics for the plumbing and electrical. Their event basically has a different type of squeezer. It appears to be two metal plates that push together and release, push together. So the MIT team believes that basically ventilating with mechanical compressions of an AMBU bag will work but we think that we have fewer moving parts. There's much less to break down in the system. It's basically compressed air and a tube. So that's why we think our device is better than the MIT device. How do you think about regulatory clearances? Um, yes, so we've already uh, downloaded some uh, materials from the FDA and also looking at the EU and UK. And basically we believe uh, we will be able to get an emergency type of clearance on very short order because of the dire need for ventilators. And uh, according to the regulation um, advice from the FDA, although they're not explicitly authorizing, um, they're acknowledging that there are going to be um, emergency situations like this and um, that similar devices um, will be and already are in use. And so they're not going to um, hold back uh, facilities from using them. Thank you, Trish. And how, when pa patients, one of the challenges is that patients have different right. lung capacity. Oh, sorry, you're cutting me off. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. Next team, I can get there, uh, is AHS, and on deck is remote possibilities. Ready? Go ahead. Hello, welcome and thank you for joining. We are AHS, 
Next slide, please. Communities all over the nation are affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and are teaming together to get involved. Salt after personal protective equipment is being donated by community members daily. The issue is the lack of a centralized donation inventory system, making it hard for health facilities to request and receive their facility needs. Next slide. Our solution coincides with something I built at Universal Health Services. It is similar in a functioning concept used at UHS on proprietary tools and proven that this concept works in a healthcare setting, specifically on national level. It's imperative to remain cognizant that our healthcare facilities nationally are strained when seeking supplies. Our tool meshes similar components, creating a public digital portal to track facility requests and donated supplies. Next slide. The current state of the situation is that donations are being directly sent to facilities without incorporating necessi necessary facility need. Next slide. Through our centralized platform, donations can be recorded and requested PPE can be pooled. Having real-time data points that are accurate, as our solution eliminates the uncertainty of what is available. This is crucial as facilities are exhausting all options in procuring PPE to treat their patients. Next slide. Our, our platform is nationally accessible for real-time feedback for all stakeholders. Teaming with organizations, federal agencies, and distributors, we create real-time access. Next slide. Inventory management is typically utilized through some form of Excel. Adapting to this commonality, you will use an Excel template. Donations will be entered and uploaded to the portal for recording. Requests will function the same as in the template to request PPE. You will submit your request to the portal. I'd like you to see the screenshot of how, the, how New Jersey plans to donate supplies. You will see New Jersey having surplus in PPE demands that neighboring state Pennsylvania seeks will be able to receive knowing that the quantity demanded is met. Next slide. With our prototype and having been vetted through clinical leadership at UHS, data is being recorded from the spreadsheet. Centralized and neighboring states can assist one another at the community level in this dire time of need. Next slide. Weeks one and two will focus on the development of the launch site, funding of the hiring and development of quality assurance experts, and seeking guidance from clinical experts and external partners. Weeks three and four will be for additional beta testing and effectively launching the portal. Next slide. AHS is comprised of as an integrative team of specialists ranging from healthcare analysts, performance improvement experts, and software engineer masterminds. Thank you for your time. All right, judges. So I guess my question is, you said you built it on a UHS uh, solution. Is, is that UHS solution more so the, the hospital solution to track and manage donations and now you're making it more central? So um, we built similar tools at UHS um, that I was involved in and helped build. Um, this is to be not for profit. This is to be, this is to be just a solution for the public crisis that's ongoing. To have a central point for community and hospitals to go to to find supplies and or donate supplies. Right. Okay. So I, I guess to go back to my first question. So what is already existing that you've helped build, Thomas, at UHS is is sort of your own internal donation management system. And now you're elevating that to be more of a central resource for the community, correct? Yes, we re-engineered it. It's not, entire, it's, not, it's not the same. The concept of a portal is the same, but we re-engineered it to specifically be for the donation and um, monitoring of supplies for community outreach. This is open sourced. Cool. Any other questions? All right, let's move on to the next team, uh, remote possibilities, and the team on deck is follow-up. This coming through. Yep. Perfect. Good afternoon. Thank you for hosting us at the MIT COVID-19 Challenge. My name is Eric. I'm a nurse with over seven years of critical care experience in ER and ICU. And to be honest, the unknowns on all fronts are absolutely terrifying to me as a frontline provider. 
Go ahead and fix that slide. As this novel coronavirus is terrorizing entire continents, it is accompanied by deafening noise. This creates a twofold problem. There's constant ever-changing data pouring in from all around, making it incredibly difficult to decipher what's true, relevant, or clinically important. Almost 75% of the healthcare workers that we surveyed regarding the information that they received reported social media groups as a primary source, not the trusted medical-based avenues slide. And perhaps even more concerning is how difficult it, slide please. Perhaps even more concerning is how difficult it has become to offer any meaningful solutions that might help the countless others on the front lines struggling to battle this new threat. There are thousands of innovative healthcare heroes who are creating efficient workarounds and life-saving process improvements out of sheer necessity. We need hospitals to see what has worked and what is not, because at the rate COVID is spreading, knowing the fixes and the failures from yesterday will actually save lives tomorrow. At CoVigilance, we're confronting both of these problems head on with our web-based curator for all things that actually make a difference regarding COVID. Slide, slide again. Rather than relying on hundreds of different outlets, CoVigilance.world, go back, uh, CoVigilance.world sources links from the newest and most important data in one concise format. And what are we doing to accelerate the helping? CoVigilance becomes a platform for sharing innovations that healthcare workers found most critical to overcoming the challenges they have now conquered. From conservation of PPE to creative ways of adapting procedures, clinicians can share and develop these critical solutions so others don't unnecessarily repeat the failures that they experienced. Slide. So how does it work? After logging into the site, you see two columns. On the left is the critical data feed offering direct links to the newest use, useful data from trusted medical sources. And on the right, the bedside innovations posted only by validated professional clinicians. These are offered to help your organization safely and quickly implement the innovations that have already been improving and saving lives in hotspots, such as PPE preservation efforts and ideas to connect isolated patients with their families. Slide. What's key is that the most helpful innovations are upvoted to ensure that it's easy for others to find them and all content is tagged so it's simple to query. Slide. The beta version is geared toward ICU care. We plan to quickly address ER followed by other clinical environments impacted by COVID. We need an academic medical institution that's already on the front line of this fight and, we're, and is looking for tools to strengthen its efforts. We know people will use this platform to find solutions that work and with the right partner, we can bring these solutions to everyone. Our goal is to devise a solution a step higher than at the hospital level in about a week and immediately start using our platform to connect hospitals with the many solutions that they desperately need. Slide. We've assembled a diverse group with a myriad of professional backgrounds to ensure that we're well equipped to get this project up and running. Slide. Thank you and please join the fight at www.covigilance.world. Okay. Judges? How do you validate participants? I, I mean, you could imagine just as an MVP, you could do this in like Reddit, as long as you had the right group defined, but you know, defining that group and ensuring that they are in fact healthcare workers and you can trust what they say seemed really critical. Absolutely, so there, one of the things that we had discussed internally was much in the same way that you would validate for getting a discount with your .edu type email address, um, perhaps taking it yet another step deeper and verifying on each of the local state level um, certification boards, safe nursing or credentials for physicians, anything like that. Um, certainly something to consider, but at the very least, we could get part of this stuff going soon. And how do you incentivize uh, clinicians to spend the time to contribute to this? So most of the clinicians are going to be rather altruistic, which is why they went into this field, not so much to make money, but to save lives. Here we're offering an additional incentive of being able to save their peers. But we know that there are plenty of, of healthcare clinicians that are going to be sidelined for self-quarantine when they test positive. So we can tap into them as an up-to-date viable resource when they can't do what they are trying desperately to be doing, which is saving others. I mean, at a more granular level, I, I also see the potential for this to be an app within the hospital because we're all getting like new information every day and new guidance every day. 
Um, so in one part, it is sort of a reference application that you would check in between shifts. And in other part, it is a suggestion box uh, where units are able to probably contribute what's working well for them. Exactly. But I think to what Lawrence mentioned, the, the challenges with the communication and engaging people, and especially in this situation, like getting them to use something and consume new information in new ways, um, that would be the challenge. But that's, I like it. That's why we need those partners. Give it the level of credibility and spread the word. Just an idea for you guys to really kickstart it. You could go to a platform like Sermo that has all validated healthcare practitioners and even use like paid survey work to sort of seed content to begin with and kind of spin it up within, within an existing healthcare community. I think you need a lot of content to get it going though, but you know, paid survey would be a cer certainly a way to get it off the ground. That's awesome. Thanks, Nate. We were also thinking about RSS feeds from some of the top government um, sources as well. Keep it flowing currently. Yeah, and healthcare, the Healthcare Coalition, the MITRE and Mayo are leading, might be another source for good data at c19hcc.org. All right, that, please. thank you. Time. So the next team is follow-up, and the team on deck is Pelizonians. By the way, the last one was, um, just we get, was that one remote possibilities? Is that what we were calling it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yes. All right. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay. So we present to you the product follow up. Next slide, please. Quick question. So is the is the team follow up or is it is the product follow up? The team follow up and the name is also the product name is also follow up. The, yeah. Yeah. So the four main problems that we're trying to address here is first is non availability of medical equipments and PPEs. The second, the disconnect between the demand and the supply. Third, there's currently no centralized procurement system. Fourth, supplier credibility. And fifth is generally still traditional tools are being used. Next slide, please. So our idea is to balance the demand and supply across the supply chain by making use of intelligent technologies. Next slide, please. So our solution is three main things, real time tra tracking of tracking hospital inventory, regional demand forecasting using AI, optimal allocation of resources, where to supply, when to supply and how to supply. Next slide, please. So we came up with a federated learning approach, which will basically weigh the predicted values versus the real time observed values and improve model on an hourly basis. So if a city notices a certain surge in cases, the forecast model will adjust for the change and reduce the overall forecast error over a region. Next slide, it's already there. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, the next one. Yeah, so the data flow. So there are basically three, three users, the warehouse, the hospital, and the suppliers. So for instance, the hospital registers in the app or the suppliers registers in the app. The hospital will give their demands and the suppliers will tell what is, what is their inventory stock up. And then using the data, we calculate the demand of a particular region, uh, particular region based on the input from the hospitals in that area. Our app also collects data about all the suppliers in the area to perform accurate resource allocation based on the need, immediate nature on the demand. And our model creates a marketplace of various suppliers and distributors to manage supply and demand based on capacity and time sensitivity. Also, there are a lot of re government regulations which has to be no notified. So built in approval and clearing house expertise and customs approvals and law laws. Next please, next page. Yeah, so these are the markup of the four slides. So just the first one is a basic registration app. The second shows the type of products which the hospital can register or the suppliers can register. The third shows a marketplace inventory using geotagging to determine the delivery time, improving in quality and quantity with price competence, bringing everything on a competitive platform. So the hospital can see different different vendors nearby, the delivery time, the stock up and the price per unit. So it's providing competence also. Next slide, please. These are short off features. The one is smart logistics, marketplace, permission network, and Paytm wallet. And you are doing payment in four steps and not in one step. So that is for a credibility and the pay. The suppliers are also in track. Next one, please. 
incentives. So it is the most important app to give transparent and accurate figures for demand and supply real time, thus enabling from order tracking and help bringing everything on a competitive platform and trust in supply chain and finances are still dynamically in a most time saving manner. Next page. So this is our team, yeah, uh, uh, undergrads from VIT Valor India. Judges. Can you talk to implementation? It seems like you're going to do a lot to replace existing systems. Sort of consistent theme across a lot of these supply chain control tower approaches. Uh, Raghav, do you want to take this up? Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, we'll be focusing on making a MVP in uh, mm -hmm. which uh, we can contact the government authorities to uh, get, a, get us a list of all the hospital centers and the uh, uh, credible suppliers. So we can uh, get them on our platform. And uh, first of all, we can initiate a, a P2P network between the healthcare centers and the suppliers to place the order directly. So that will be our MVP, first of all. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think I'm wondering how you get them all signed up and you know plugged into your systems and what it replaces in their existing systems. Okay, so yes. uh, for this, we are going to contact government authorities. For example, we are based in India, so there's a Ministry of Health Affairs, which can pro provide us with all the list of hospitals which are uh, tackling COVID-19 for now. And also, there are platforms like uh, 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 Panjiva, uh, which can give us the list of credible suppliers. So uh, we can uh, contact the suppliers or uh, uh, through these data, after we get the list, we can contact them and get them on our network. We can uh, register and uh, uh, they can come to uh, the common marketplace and uh, uh, interact I, with I, the health care and the suppliers. Thank you. All right, thank you. The next team to go is Pelizonians. And actually, SN is not here. So, is Pelizonians ready? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me clearly? Yep. All right, great. And on deck is COVID busters, by the way. So. Hi, we're Team Pelizonians and we're presenting our solution, MediShare. Next. Now, the problem we're trying to address is at its core a very simple issue of supply and demand and the misallocation of resources. With the ongoing pandemic, medical supplies and equipment around the nation have been lacking forcing doctors to reuse contaminated masks and scrounge for their own equipment. In fact, according to the Department of Health and Human Services, as of March, the US had only 1% of what is estimated to be needed for the pandemic. Next. So our solution for this is a marketplace to connect regional organizations with medical supplies uh, to stakeholders in need of PPEs, cleaning supplies and durable medical equipment all things that we confirmed were needed by hospitals with our mentors. So we will be connecting cross industry supply distributors, medical supply distributors, and state slash local government stockpiles with health systems and health clinics and volunteer networks. Next. So here's a quick walkthrough of uh, what our interface and what it would look like from both sides of the process. So let's say, for example, you're a hospital administrator and you need supplies. You type in a quick query with uh, different filters like location, when you need it by, the amount of supplies you require, and pricing options, whether you want donation or whether you know, you're looking for goods that you have to pay for. And um, you know, you'd come up with a search result that looks somewhat like this, and you'd be able to select items. Next. And this is what it would look like from the supplier user interface. If you have COVID supplies, you fill out a brief form and your listing will be posted for people in need of supplies to interact with. Now, obviously, uh, the UI and UX is still in its initial phases, but uh, our main goal is to have this be clean and intuitive so that hospital administrators and suppliers will be easily able to adapt and use this without any disruption. Next. So moving on, uh, let's go into our implementation plan. Initially, uh, we're gonna try to work with um, partners of this hackathon and establish hospital networks with high-tech integrated inventory management systems so that we'll be able to uh, analyze the data of their inventory systems and be able to measure and um, integrate them fully into our software. After this, we'll be iterating and moving on to smaller hospital networks and even community and nonprofit hospitals where perhaps data and um, 
technology integration is not as refined, but the need certainly is still great. Working with them to uh, find a place in between their logistical and technological thresholds where we can operate. After the crisis has stopped, uh, we'll be onboarding more hospitals and more organizations and trying to expand the scale of our network and using the data we've gathered to make optimization suggestions and provide analytical help. Next. So uh, in this hackathon, we're looking for partners, first of all, to help us with uh, building our product. Um, and we're looking for partners that will help us uh, test our product in initial stages. Thank you. Judges? All right. I think I'll go back to Nate's <laughs> common question, which is how, how does this really change uh, the existing supply chain? You know, what is, what is the key difference that you're building here that doesn't already exist? Sure. So the existing supply chain, um, you know, works with manufacturers and works with suppliers, but doesn't exactly work with um, non-traditional options like the construction industry, for example, has a lot of access to uh, PPE equipment that can be repurposed for um, medical usage and volunteers as well. And at the same time, um, part of our solution is, you know, providing data to local governments so that they can find out how to distribute more effectively to um, company, uh, to hospitals, because local governments currently are just allocating based off of requests. And a data-driven approach to this would help them increase the efficiency greatly. Um, I, I know on the hospital side or the provider side, you are kind of going after all the health systems, but how are you going to kind of disseminate that this platform exists on the, um, you know, on the, the, the vendor side? Right. In terms of the vendor side, um, so first off, like we said, we'll be starting using our own connections uh, from this hackathon, the different partners. And, um, you know, hopefully using that, we can garner a greater network and inform them about our solution and its potential over time. All right, thank you. Next team up is COVID Busters. And on deck, we have Covinian Distribution. And feel free to go and start when you're ready. Sure. Uh, give uh, the micro to Winnie, please. Winnie is who's talking? Yes, Winnie should talk. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, sorry about that confusion. Yes, I will be talking. Um, let me know whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Okay, well, thank you for having us. We're team COVID busters, and we're here to talk to you all about the shortage of life support supplies in the ICUs and our solutions for better decision making. Next. As you know, COVID cases are flooding ICUs with demand exceeding supplies at hospitals around the world. Medical teams and physicians in particular are now facing the agonizing emotional challenge of choosing who should receive life saving care and who will not. How does one decide? Next. Our solution leverages all stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem, fostering transparency and reinforcing trust with the public to understand the difficult decisions that are being made. Next. Our solutions are to offload the decision making from the physician by using a two pronged approach. We propose implementing a hospital level framework for guidance and delivering an actual real time solution for physicians in the ICU. Next. How this will work is hospitals will connect to a network of experts across stakeholder interest groups. Next. And they will select an appropriate framework with associated guidelines using a scored point system that's specific to the site's needs. Next. This is incorporated into a mobile friendly web based solution that leverages the hospital infrastructure for patient data when they're admitted to the hospital. Next. And the physicians, next slide please. Uh, physicians receive a data-driven solution with real-time push notifications on their mobiles that have the hospital directives. So the physician can focus on patient care and advocate for the patient if needed as a fail safe. Next. 
And to address the market viability and adoption, we looked at what hospitals are doing today. It's currently a fragmented approach without a national directive, and hospitals range from no protocol to some data-driven rationing procedure. For collaboration, various hospitals, particularly in the Boston area, have used tech-supported decision-making and voice interest. Next. We reached out to the channel mentors and spoke to eight different healthcare providers, clinicians in eight different hospitals across three continents. They were highly interested in a solution. We incorporated their guidance on metrics and then focused on timeliness and preference for a mobile application. Next. We plan to create a national coordinated effort to allocate the resources leveraging known tech platforms to provide an actual real-time solution for the front line. We think there's an opportunity to work on corporate partnerships on this front, upholding public transparency and trust. Next is our product technology stack, which shows where the data inputs from the hospital systems are, how we use existing software to interact with hospital systems, and then the output is mobile, user-friendly for the ICU physicians. Next. Our metrics focus on frontline healthcare workers' morale and measuring their participation as a labor force, and obviously the technical effectiveness of the solution in providing patient care ultimately focus on total lives saved within the given resource constraints. Next. We have an aggressive timeline for prototyping and beta testing. Obviously, this will be majority of the initial funding uh, focused on a minimum viable product and launching at a beta site where through our interaction with Mass General, Dr. Evi Kevin Elias, he has expressed interest. I have time. And, oh, and the next one is just our team slide, if you wanted to. Yeah. So it's, amazingly, this is like the first legitimate clinical decision support tool we've seen in this entire track. Um, could you speak to like a, a specific use case? I think you talked generally to like working in the ICU, like only like one example of some decision where like a patient's in front of a doctor and they say, you get this or you don't get that. Right. And um, I, I hope I can answer that. I also want to unmute my team members if that's possible. I'll attack this right now if I can. But you're 100% right. It depends on actually the hospital level, what framework they're using to assess. Um, there's a SOFA framework that gives point systems based on the age, more comorbidity factors. We have to layer in um, uh, the changing data that is relevant to the COVID pandemic crisis because obviously different individuals are reacting differently depending on their risk factors, but you're 100% right. And then you elevate it based on the different layers of the ICU ventilators because there's different se severities. If you're essentially intubating with a ventilator, you cannot reallocate that resource. So, and this is gonna be directed at the physician. I'm gonna pause in case I didn't answer your question. <laughs> Any other questions? How do, you, how do you get physicians to trust a system that you know, is going to tell them to whether somebody lives or dies. May I answer this question, please? Yes. Um, uh, so currently this is getting, this is happening at different hospitals with different systems. There's a triage committee and sometimes an ethics committee board that handles this decision. So it's not at the physician level and they will sometimes, depending on the hospital, determine how that's relayed to the family and next of kin. And so we want the physician to take the directive, but then have that human component where they are the fail safe or they're, they can advocate for the patient. And so there's an alignment of interest in terms of the physician remaining as the provider of care for the patient, but there's a hospital that oversees and kind of thinks about it from a resource allocation. Naturally, Thank there you. has to be a best practice to determine how that unfolds. So yes, there needs to be buy-in on across the level and across the board. That's why we need a network. All right, thank you. The next team is Convenient Distribution, and on deck is Nexus. Are you guys ready? All right, yes, we're ready. Go ahead. So welcome to Covenient Distribution. We're providing solutions to simplify distribution at, with, for critical supplies as they arrive to the hospitals. Next slide. So first I'd like to introduce you to Jared. Jared works in materials management. Outside of COVID-19, he stocks supplies at each location. But during this time of crisis, he's focused on ma managing supplies with tighter restrictions, such as N95 masks. Meanwhile, the Boston community at large have donated lots of items, 
but Jared doesn't have the time or capacity to process and check the quality of these donations. He needs a way to streamline his tasks. He is overwhelmed and he's in a very critical role. Next slide. So our motivation stems from conversations we had with subject matter experts at, um, within Brigham and Women's University, or sorry, hospital. And we, some of the data we got is that 7,000 employees go through a check-in process daily with that one minute processing time that costs about 120 hours of labor. Uh, we also want to minimize the staff exposure by streamlining distribution needs. And this leads us to our mission to streamline the process where possible to distribute inventory more efficiently once it arrives at the hospital. Next slide. So our solution is summarized in standardizing and pre-kitting the PPE as it arrives, as shown in the example below. Obviously, we would um, scale to where appropriate for different healthcare providers. Next. And we'd like to trial this at Brigham and Women's for first in, um, implementation, next. And our goal is for impact of reducing distribution time by 30 seconds, next. And um, mainly to reduce the burden on materials management to free them up for other critical activities. Next. Thanks, Ellie, for going over how, uh, kind of our objective here. So there's really like th three main parts that we need to do to make this happen. So first is standardize the kit setup that we issue to our, our workers every day. Second, set up some sort of kitting operation. And third, organize employees to support the operations here. In order to support this, we built several tools, including a um, Excel sheet to generate standardized kits based on real consumption history. Um, Pre-configured layout of tables and shelves in order to set up a small kitting operation with standard off-the-shelf um, items that are available and instructions to prepare inexperienced employees on how to build kits every day. Next. So our team is split up into training, procurement, expansion, hospital liaison, and operations. And next and final slide. So um, the time is, is now to take action and, and help these critical workers who um, support our frontline operations and make sure that the hospital can operate every day. And we'd like to open it up to any questions you guys might have. Do all items in the kit get consumed at the same rate? So the idea is that um, what we've heard is that when the doctors and nurses come in to start their shift, they go and they pick up their critical items for the beginning of the day. And then throughout the day, um, the materials management group goes and resupplies different floors as they need it. Um, so this is really to address the, the flood of nurses and doctors as they come in to start their shift um, and to get that process more efficiently operating. Okay. By the way, I like the on theme background. Almost. Oh, Ellie. <laughs> Uh, and this is um, kind of on the implementation question, but um, I know you have the kit, so you have to give it to the nurses or kind of the staff, but have you thought about a contactless way of kind of distributing that or to minimize any of the transfer? Yeah, that's definitely something that, that we could look at implementing. One of the great things is that the doctors and nurses and practitioners are all checking in online um, already. So knowing who's coming in and, and what shift they're going to, um, we could definitely utilize some of that information to distribute this to the floors um, potentially and, and potentially even label boxes with um, practitioners' names on them so that they have identifying features on them. All right, the next team is Nexus. And on deck is Kit Cats. Hi, this is Richard for Team Nexus. Can you guys hear me? There you go. Great. I'll go ahead and get started now. Uh, three, two, one, mark. Hi, so we're Nexus. Our goal is to fix the problem of PPE production shortfall through the leveraging of existing local manufacturing capabilities in a seamless and autonomous way. Next slide, please. What's the problem? It's a two-fold approach. First, we know about the healthcare procurement managers who don't have a diverse enough supply chain to meet the demand surge for PPE and other critical medical equipment. 
there's a second piece of it, which is local small manufacturers who have the open capacity and ability to produce, but they're unable to meet that demand surge. Next slide, please. So how do we diversify the supply chain while supporting small or minority businesses at the same time? That's the real question here. Next slide, please. The numbers show that we have an increased demand surge, not something small, but something highly exponential in nature. Next slide. And that has led to a very immediate shortage of supplies. Next slide, please. The goal is to connect GPOs and IDNs, which typically work on the behalf of hospitals to contact multiple vendors and fulfill their large scale orders by seamlessly and autonomously breaking these apart into mini contracts that smaller local manufacturers can fulfill with the guarantee of payment, commitment, and knowing that their work is actually going towards something huge and beneficial. Next slide, please. So an implementation of something like this can happen in a matter of weeks, not years. And given the aggressiveness and the timeline of the virus at hand, that's the kind of timeline we need. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, it's all right. Well, so we have various key stakeholders who have all echoed the same message, which is A, the need to diversify the supply chain. So that's not going to the typical large manufacturers, but also a need to support smaller local businesses and manufacturing, which may be faced with layoffs, a need to stay afloat, et cetera. So we can match both of these people and help produce a great solution. Next slide, please. Currently, current solutions just don't meet the increased demand that's such a huge spike, but also just the fact that they don't take advantage of local manufacturing capabilities. Usually they do that through a reshuffling of existing pipelines, through tapping into existing production lines that are already being stretched thin. That's what Nexus hopes to solve. Next slide, please. So we just wanna reiterate, we're trying to solve the problem of PPE production shortfall through the leveraging of existing local manufacturing capabilities in a seamless and autonomous way. So GPOs and IDNs can, can seamlessly engage to these local manufacturers, which hospitals typically don't reach out to the multiple suppliers. They, want through, they go through one main contact. Uh, thank you. Mark, 250. Judges? Questions? Would you be able to unmute my teammates, please? How do you, one of the things that, uh, that you often deal with on the manufacturing side is all the certification and bringing manufacturers up to speed with the regulatory implications. How do you uh, propose to handle that with Nexus? So a big part of Nexus in terms of just how we're going about it is providing resources for these small manufacturers to convert. I think you guys have seen in the news lately how multiple state governments are willing to fund the initial costs of establishing certification, of going through and saying, hey, we're certified to manufacture XYZ supplies. So Nexus is not only meant to be for the buy side, but also the sell side. So it's about... Um, bringing together those resources and doing so in a very guided way that manufacturers don't have to navigate the labyrinth of um, requirements. Yeah, and to add on to that, uh, right now to start off with, to address this crisis, um, we are looking at medical supplies basically, which are um, lowest in the regulatory um, uh, regulatory bandwidth if you wanna look at it. And also um, when we say we are dividing it up into micro contracts, it also means a quality verification contract conducted by somebody who is trusted by the authorities as well. So small, small manufacturers can manufacture, quality check can be done by somebody else, and it could be accepted by the GPO. Thank you. All right. Thank you, judges, and thank you, Nexus. Next team is KitKats. Hello. Hello. Okay. Go ahead and start when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, so, hello everyone. Um, we Our product is called VDist. It's a COVID supplies distribution system. Um, next slide, please. So, the problem that we identified is that there are disrupted supply chains in this entire 
in this entire pandemic that's going on, while there is a shortfall of resources and on the front lines and uh, while on the other hand, in some of the for some of the people, they do have resources, but they just don't know how to send it, where to send it, and what to do with it. And so there's, there is an inequitable allotment of resources. So the what we want to do is want we want to find a better way to match supply with need, and to match volunteers with help seekers and hospitals with scarce resources. Next slide, please. So, uh, so the examples of current systems that we found are things like Project N95, which is a platform to request and donate supplies. There's the Massachusetts government procurement platform, which is also of the same range. The issue we found is that there is not a lot of automatic equitable matching that's going on. And also most of these platforms do not have a space for like third party volunteers who can carry out the transportation and other necessities for suppose if hospitals don't have their own transportation ability and neither do like donors want to go out, but there are other people who might be okay with doing that or who might be allowed to do that in lockdown situations. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is like and like as what the Massachusetts government uh, donation procurement form is like. So people can mention their needs or what they have, but the uh, matching is not automated or equitable. Next slide. Uh, we cannot hear you. Sorry, my teammate speaking. But hello, is it? Okay, so in this in this project, what we aim to do was um, set up a way to match providers or suppliers and people who need these products and people who can transport them and transport them equitably. So a supplier who was originally set up to transport to a hospital far away might not be, it might not be the best strategy to do so. We might be able to connect them to a hospital that's closer by. And the ultimate goal is not to um, maximize the overall amount of um, stuff that gets supplied, but we also want to ensure um, stuff of each kind gets supplied. Um, can you move on to the next slide, please? So we, we um, have a, a user-facing front end, which will allow people to create accounts and list themselves as volunteers, suppliers, um, medical facilities, and um, healthcare workers, and they can either list that they have products available for supply or that they need products or they can volunteer their time. And then on the back end, we will match these um, various players using um, something like a max flow algorithm that will optimize the amount of um, products that get transported to who needs them and the time that volunteers are spending on this. Next slide, please. So here's an example. Um, of a prototype that we built in the limited time. So you can see on the right hand side, um, oh, right. A, hospital, yeah. a hospital has signed in and that that's there. Yeah. And next, please. Judges, questions? I'd like to hear more about this volunteer for transport thing. That seems to be a nugget we haven't heard anything about much today. Um, could you dig into that problem statement and how you're imagining the solution on your end of it? Sure. So, um, in so uh, imagine there are going to be a bunch of volunteers who are um, currently in lockdown or facing stay-at-home orders, but they can go out at a time and they are willing to help out people in their neighborhoods or in neighborhoods close by who, who may be vulnerable or who may be elderly and they should not really step out. So um, these elderly people can sign up for um, or request um, groceries to be transported to them and volunteers can look at these requests and either pick them individually or just sign up, volunteer their time and our algorithms will match them with these people. And um, it will take into account the um, time overlap. So if a volunteer only volunteers a range of their time, then they will only be matched within that range and within some particular radius of distance from their home location. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, so we have one last team. Um, to team Skisset. Um, team Skisset, so if you can now join, we'll try again and see if we're able to connect.
the one who just went was Kit Kats, is that Hello? right? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, so shall, we, uh, shall I start the presentation? Okay, next. Okay. Uh, according to a statistical report, we are crossing 1 million people affected by coronavirus, and uh, the death rates are also increasing, and the people are facing, uh, many uh, people are on the fourth stage of this coronavirus. So they need some respiratory uh, respiratory systems to be helped for their livelihood. So, so much respiratory systems. So actually a ventilator is so much of cost and it's really costly. And uh, many countries in this world are lacking of uh, respiratory systems such as ventilators and such as things. Next slide, sir. And uh, uh, the com coming to stage four of Corona, the, it spreads very rapidly and it increases the count uh, uh, very fast. So we have also decided uh, to to help the doctors and uh, the medical team to overcome the scars that they face in the respiratory systems available and the number of ventilators available. Next slide, sir. And this is the problem that we face in our country. Uh, our country has a very small count of just uh, 2,400 corona cases, but once it increases rapidly, uh, India is a highly populated country and it's also a developing country. So we need a lot of respiratory systems and ventilators. And uh, so we have also decided uh, to come up with a solution with this before it extends uh, to a massive count such as uh, uh, massive counts such as uh, in lakhs and uh, hundred thousands. Next slide, sir. And these are the solutions we have come out with. Uh, uh, we have also come out with the splitters that are used in the ventilators so that a single ventilator can be used for multiple patients at a time. And uh, these splitters have been designed in a way that they are, do not disturb the flow, regular flow of the ventilators. Uh, and also they have been done and analyzed uh, through CFD and we have also come up uh, with the efficient design of this uh, splitter, ventilator splitters. Next slide, sir. Next slide, sir. Next slide. Yes. Uh, this is the splitters uh, 2D sketch and the next picture you see is the Splitters uh, three, uh, 3D model prototype that we have made using 3D printers. And uh, the, uh, as you see, the inlet diameter of the splitter is uh, higher and the outlet diameter of the splitter is lower. And uh, the, as, uh, the, we have reduced the diameter changes so that we don't lose any velocity and uh, the patient do not feel any difficulty by using a splitter. Uh, and we don't uh, lose any flow in the ventilators. Next slide, sir. We are out of time now. I'm sorry. Judges, do you have questions? Um, I assume this is going to be 3D printed, but um, can you tell more about how you're going to basically scale or, um, you know, quickly, assuming this works, um, quickly get this up to, up to production? Um, this, uh... This uh, material is PA12, it's a polymer and it can, it's also easily available and economic. Uh, so it can be easily bought and 3D printed and uh, this can also, this is also, the specialty of this material is the minimal level water absorption which is needed uh, for the ventilators. So this material can be easily pr produced within a, a time of half an hour and its co production cost is also very low. So this can also be marketed to hospitals uh, in and around half an hour to make one no you can also create 10 pieces at a time it depends upon the 3d printer you use and the number of uh, ability of the 3d printer to print uh, materials actually do, printer do, act do ventilators have an appropriate uh, Excuse, pressure to distribute to two patients at once. Excuse me, sir. 
I got They're not generally designed for that, and that's one of the key issues of the splitter is that you basically have to manage putting people. There, there are lots of open source, uh, you know, pictures of splitters for this as a way of increasing the number of patients a ventilator can handle. Yeah. Sorry, sir, I can't get your question. It's unclear to me that the ventilators could could provide enough pressure to kind of service two patients or how it might be dialed up and tuned based on the needs of one patient or another. I um, mean, just like a hose valve, you know, off the side of your house, you're going to need to kind of control one differentially from the other. Um, so I sort of question how feasible just a simple splitter would, would be based on the needs of the patient. So uh, as your question uh, is, sir, how do you control two patients at the same time uh, when they have a change of flow or something? Is that the question? Essentially. We are out of time. Uh, thank you, judges. And thank you to everyone that presented today. Um, so the next step is uh, that the judges will go into deliberations for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, we will uh, reconvene all of the tracks together in one large webinar uh, that will start in roughly 15 or 20 minutes from now. Um, and that link should be available in the general, uh, or will be made available in the general session if it hasn't already. Um, and we'll make the announcement in the tracks as well in terms of joining for that webinar. I uh, wanted to take this opportunity to thank again all the participants for the great job they've done all weekend long to, especially in a virtual environment where everyone is coming from across the world to do this. Um, and uh, also want to thank the judges for spending their the, uh, this time with us as well, listening to all these pitches. Okay. I agree. Freddie, I think we should take a picture. Yes. <laughs> I uh, it's gonna take many screens here, so give me one second. Okay, everyone's got their cameras turned on. I take about five of these screens, okay? All right, we're gonna go ahead and start. First one, second one, third, fourth. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. I'll share this in the channel as well for you guys to have. Thank you so much for working on this track. Um, it was exciting to work with many of you. Thanks for all the pitches. Yep, and looking forward to seeing how you guys continue on these ideas after this weekend as well. So uh, we'll also send out a link to the survey for this event. Uh, please send us your feedback, what went well, what didn't go well, uh, so that we can uh, improve on that for the next time, uh, which hopefully you'll be able to join as well if you're not continuing on your ideas. Thanks, everybody.